Hello Internet, Sky here, and today we are at Cape Canaveral again, watching the launch of another SpaceX rocket. Although this time something bigger and louder soars into the sky. Four, three, two, one, two. SpaceX Falcon Heavy is a super heavy carrier rocket developed by SpaceX a few months ago. Not such a distant past. At the moment this guy is the most powerful carrier rocket of all. As we already know, the main idea of the Mars Society is the colonization of, you guessed it, Mars. Back in the early 2000s, Elon Musk, being associated with this organization, founded SpaceX and declared flights to the Red Planet as the main long-term mission of his new company. But in the beginning, this mission did not quite fit in the real world. The Falcon 1 developed at the time, being a lightweight carrier rocket, was not very suitable for flights to other planets. And SpaceX had plans to create a super heavy rocket based on the future senior model Falcon 5. But as history showed, these plans remained plans. Falcon 5 was not created and gave way to the main model of the company, Falcon 9. At the beginning of 2010, the ideas to do something big and cool started to develop into real projects. The first test launches of Falcon 9 proved that firstly it was a rocket, not a bomb, and secondly that it has very good specifications. Even then, SpaceX claimed that their future super heavy rocket would become the most powerful in the world, equaled only by the legends of space race times. At the same time, as always, the crazy deadlines were announced. The first start, 2013. But this story didn't happen. The idea of combining three first stages to create a heavier version was not as simple as it seemed. The designers faced a lot of difficult tasks, requiring complex solutions. Financing was also difficult. Falcon 9 being a medium and heavy class rocket, perfectly suited or rather were initially created for future cargo and manned missions. The creation of that rocket was partially funded by NASA COTS and in the future CRS programs. Super heavy carrier of course is a useful device, but NASA was not particularly interested in it. For flights to ISS it is unnecessarily powerful and heavy. And for programs that require a super heavy carrier, they developed their own SLS rocket. So SpaceX was left alone with their 500 million Falcon Heavy program. Another great barrier for Falcon Heavy can be called, strangely as it is, Falcon 9. After the start of the operations, the rocket was constantly upgraded, developing its capabilities. But this fun is not free. The rocket required a lot of attention and there was simply not enough time to work on the super heavy version. But they did not abandon it. The progress was slowly moving forward. Tests of a number of specially created systems began in 2013. One of the SpaceX main challenges was the fact that if Falcon 9 was named so because of the 9 engines it had, then the future rocket could easily be called Falcon 27. The Heavy was a combination of three first stages of the 9s, which meant that it was necessary to provide synchronous and effective operation of 27 engines at once. More was only on the Soviet giant N1, 30 units, and at that time such a big number of engines did not help at all. To prevent the SpaceX flagship from repeating the fate of sighted rocket, engineers spent a lot of time on the power plant development, mostly at the McGregor site. After Falcon 9 proved its effectiveness, SpaceX received one big and valuable trophy, the contract for the lease of the launch pad LC-39A of the Kennedy Space Station, the most famous one. It was there that the Saturn V rocket and later the Space Shuttle were launched. After the shuttle's retirement, the site for the most part remained inactive. NASA economists decided that instead of spending money on its maintenance, it would be better to earn money on its lease. And here, Musk and his Falcon Heavy became very handy. The first launches were planned to begin in 2015, but fate once again had other plans. In the very same year of 2015, there was the Falcon 9 launch failure, when it exploded in flight. This led to the disruption of CRS mission to the International Space Station. 
the company directed all efforts to investigate and solve problems with the rocket. During the following year, 2016, another accident occurred. This time, not only did Falcon Heavy lose its priority again, until the next investigation, but also Falcon 9 exploded on the ground, destroying the launch pad of the Cape Canaveral station. For the time of its repairs, the Falcon 9 launches were moved to the Kennedy station, to the site meant for the Heavy. The rocket itself continued to give the engineers more tasks. As it turned out, the central core needed to be strengthened vastly. More so, the Falcons are now reusable, and so the Heavy's first stage must return, three boosters at the same time. Even for such desperate guys, it was pretty crazy. The timing of the first launch neatly shifted up to 2017, and the risks were so high that even the usually very optimistic Elon Musk admitted the probability of failure. The spectacle was planned to be very bright in any case. But it was preferable that at least a new and expensive launch pad would survive this show. In December 2017, the preparation of the rocket for launch was at the final stage. Instead of the standard test dummy payload, the guys from SpaceX put the Tesla Roadster. Finally, on February 6, 2018, the first test launch of Falcon Heavy was made. It was an awesome show. Given that the news nowadays consists mostly of stupid political shows and criminal chronicles, the launch of a new rocket watered them down, at least briefly. The star of the show was, of course, Starman a mannequin driver dressed in a SpaceX flight suit prototype, which will soon be used in manned missions. In general, this suit is not intended for work in open space, but this is one of the plastic astronauts' advantages. They do not complain about labor conditions. Elon Musk's bright red electric car is mounted on a special platform with a bunch of cameras. During the flight, David Bowie's Space Oddity and Life on Mars songs were played. As an extra baggage, a special disc with the recorded Isaac Azimov's Foundation book series was also loaded into the car. The Roadster can be considered the fourth car in space. The first three were delivered to the moon by Apollo missions 15, 16 and 17, although those three also drove, and this one is unlikely to ever touch the ground with its wheels. At least if after 70 years some collectors do not catch it, I think it would be great to raise some money on this artifact. To ordinary people, it may seem like this launch was nothing more than a good show. They've advertised SpaceX, advertised Elon Musk, advertised Tesla, although they could send a new roster, not the old one. So that's all. At first look, yes. But do not overestimate the marketing priorities. We can start with the Tesla. The first start being a test does not imply the launch of any real payload. Most often in such operations there are dummy payloads that should only simulate the mass and dimensions of the certain satellite. In this case, instead of a metal block, they launched a car with a plastic guy in an expensive suit. It is mostly a similar test payload, but much more fun. But if we will turn off the marketing and watch the facts... During this launch the ground infrastructure was tested. First of all the launch complex, which only at first look seems like a simple big metal structure. Who said that everything will work out smoothly? and the launch pad will not fall apart during the start. The rocket, after all, weighs almost one and a half thousand tons. Secondly, it was necessary to confirm the ability of all onboard systems to operate effectively and safely. The ignition of 27 engines, the separation of the boosters in flight, the return to Earth of three first stages at once, one of which was to return from a very high energy flight at high altitude and speed. There were more risks than that. No one could guarantee that all this beauty will not fall apart during one of those episodes. And thirdly, the mannequin in the suit, the flight to Mars and David Bowie is of course cool, but it was still a test launch of the payload into far space. The second stage performed a whole set of operations, including multiple ignitions of the engine, all of it at a considerable distance from Earth while passing the Van Allen radiation belts. It was necessary to confirm that the charged particles of outer space would not fry the electronics. Almost none of the above SpaceX has ever done. And all this had to be checked in practice during a single flight. So the party at Musk's company was not so carefree as it seems from this side of the screen. The payload was accelerated to the escape velocity, which enabled the car to overcome the Earth gravity and reach the elliptical orbit of the Sun. The farthest point of this orbit is the aphelion. It will be behind the orbit of Mars. 
and the nearest one, perihelion, is slightly below the Earth orbit. In this case, of course, it is worth mentioning the expense of Tesla was supposed to fly to Mars and instead it will spin somewhere in outer space. The point is that no one ever intended to send Tesla to Mars. The car, as before, has the escape velocity and to bring it out, at least to the orbit of the red planet, it would have to reduce speed a lot. Maneuvers by the engine were not provided here. And braking specifications of the car tires in space, well, they're not quite effective. So Tesla will just fly by Mars and continue orbiting the Sun. Nothing else was expected of it. The rocket on the first launch was assembled in a completely reusable configuration, with boosters and core stage equipped with landing elements, titanium grid fins, landing legs and other systems, inherited from Falcon 9. At the same time, the side boosters are the first stages of the Falcon 9, already used earlier in CRS-9 and SACOM-8 missions, performed in 2016. Absolutely new was the central core, which required modification and reinforcement of the structure. In flight, the side boosters successfully separated from the central core and, like two slender ballerinas, almost synchronously returned home to Florida. But the central core was not so lucky. At the final phase, when the stage had to land on the floating platform Of Course I Still Love You, there was a failure. Two out of three engines did not ignite, and the 40 meter high stage collapsed into water at a speed of about 500 km per hour near the platform. And so the platform itself received a lot of damage. There's a test of love for you. Well, I'm already in the details, and I didn't really tell you much about the rocket itself. Falcon Heavy is a super heavy lift launch vehicle, with some conditions, but more on that later. The design of the rocket is based on the ideology of constructing universal rocket modules. The sense of it is that the stages of the rocket of a light class can be grouped into more heavy carriers. In fact, it is possible to produce different rockets while doing one module, which allows you to save money. Such a scheme is quite popular and is used for example on Delta IV rockets as the universal models in this case are first stages of the basic Falcon 9 FT rockets, a modified and reinforced central core plus two conventional stages as attached boosters. The power plant is common for the full thrust version, equipped with Merlin 1D engines. There are as many as 27 of them and they create a thrust of almost 23,000 kilonewtons. This is more than twice the thrust of protons and deltas but of course much less than Energias and Saturns. They have these figures go for enormous 35,000 kilonewtons. For clarity, you can compare with aviation. For example, the Boeing 777X is a proud owner of General Electric GE9X engines, one of the most powerful in the world, with a thrust of 480 kilonewtons. Just a little fan compared to these blazing monsters. The operational scheme of the first stage assumes that the central core must work for a longer time than the side boosters. Since the fuel capacity is the same for them, SpaceX had plans to create a fuel transfer system, but it was too complicated. As a result, it was decided to act more simply. The central core reaches maximum thrust at the initial stage of the flight, but later reduces the thrust to save fuel. After separating the boosters, the remaining central core once again reaches the maximum mode, until it separates from the second stage. ULA uses a similar scheme on its Delta IV Heavy rocket, which also uses three modules. The side boosters mounting schemes are similar to Delta IV Heavy as well. The boosters are fixed with special supports of the central core. During the separation the hydraulic supports push off the boosters, and they turn on the central engine for a few seconds to safely move away from the rocket. The second stage is taken directly from the basic Falcon 9. It is equipped with a single Merlin 1D engine, modified to work in vacuum. The engine develops thrust up to 943 kN and, as I said earlier, can be restarted many times to perform orbital maneuvers. Falcon Heavy uses a standard fairing, 13.1 meters high and 5.2 meters in diameter, the same as the one used on Falcon 9. 
Now SpaceX develops and tests special systems to ensure the possibility of returning the fairings to Earth with their subsequent reapplication. To do this, they've even created a special landing pad ship. Mr. Steven will catch this fish with a wide net, with the nuance that the fish will descend from the sky. People who know the rocket, or those who watched the video about Falcon 9, could ask the question. The central core crashed because it had two out of three engines malfunctioning. But there was always only one engine working on landing, wasn't there? In this flight, another innovation was tested. Previously, they really did land the stages using only one central engine during the return process. But now there is a new scheme. The stages are in free fall almost all the way, under the control of new titanium grid fins. And only in the last seconds before landing, three engines are launched at once, which drastically drops the speed of the stage, gently landing it. Well, in two cases out of three, it turned out gently. This allows to decently reduce the amount of fuel required for landing, which is very good for the payload mass. By the way, about that precious payload. Falcon Heavy is capable of launching up to 64 tons of payload into the low Earth orbit, which makes it a super heavy lift class rocket. The rocket is able to launch almost 27 tons of payload into the geostationary transfer orbit, up to 16.8 tons to Mars and even 3.5 tons to Pluto. Yes bro, you're no longer a planet, but we still remember you. But of course, not without nuances. It's time to read the text in small print. All these specifications, which classify the rocket as a super heavy vehicle, relate to a completely expandable version, not equipped with additional systems and fuel for returning to Earth. The structure of reusable versions is heavier, which reduces the payload mass. If all three modules of the first stage have a toolkit for return, the launch payload mass to the GTO will be reduced from 26.7 to 8 tons and to a low Earth orbit to about 30 tons. This means that the reusable version of Falcon Heavy returns to the class of heavy carrier rockets, back to protons and deltas. Except we should remember that the reusable Falcons are quite cheap, while the cost of the Delta IV Heavy is about as huge as the rocket itself. And of course, about the prices. According to the current price list, the launch of an expendable heavy will make your wallet thinner by about 150 million dollars. A lot of money, but for top specifications it is very cheap, especially considering that no one else can launch such payloads today. If for some strange reason you don't have an extra 150 million, there is a price list for a reusable version. The performance of course will be lower, but the launch cost will drop to 90 million. The heavy rocket will not be used as actively as its younger brother. Moreover, the advanced Falcon 9 FT stepped into the niche of the senior model, and some contracts for the launch of heavy were carried out by the full thrust rockets. The delays in development and market release did not help either. The contract with Inmarsat from 2014 also went to Falcon 9 and European Ariane 5. The next launch of Falcon Heavy will be the EELV mission, scheduled on summer by the order of the US Air Force. This is not quite an ordinary contract, but rather certification test for admissions of order from the US government agencies, in particular the military. The ULA prices are painful, so this competition is clearly encouraging the American Army. During the test process, the rocket will launch real payloads. The practice of launching Musk's cars into space is paused for now. There was of course the sensational story in 2017, that Falcon Heavy will send a Dragon 2 spaceship with tourists on board to the moon. The names of the desperate travelers are unknown in fact, as well as the prospects of this idea. It is known that the Heavy will not be adapted for manned flights, so at least the initial plans should change. It was also assumed that Falcon Heavy and Dragon 2 will become platforms for research missions to outer space, including the landings on the celestial objects of the solar system, Mars, Europe, etc. However, later SpaceX decided to minimize new modifications of this rocket, spending the maximum resources to create a new generation of giant Falcons, the BFR Super Heavy rockets. By 2018, SpaceX received orders for three launches of Falcon Heavy. During 2018, there will be two launches, in the interest of the US Air Force and on a commercial order from Arabsat from Saudi Arabia. 
The next launch commissioned by Viasat Corporation is scheduled for 2020. And for now this is it. That last phrase is puzzling. In general, the wave of admiration for the launch of this rocket can only be compared with the wave of bile, which, like a tsunami in the disaster movies, demolished everything indiscriminately. Most of the issues for this wave, frankly speaking, are very strange and I don't see a reason to comment on them. However, I rarely saw the main question to the super heavy rockets. What's the point? Saturns were developed for flights to the moon, and after the Apollo program was finished, those rockets were launched just a few times. The Soviet Energia Super Heavy rockets mostly were too powerful for their time too. The same question can be asked to the future main NASA SLS rocket. Is it worth all this effort, given how much resources it takes? And yes, the same question can be asked of the Falcon Heavy. 64 tons is almost the mass of a fully loaded and filled Bombardier CS-300 airliner. The module Zarya which is in fact the core of the International Space Station, weighs only 20 tons. The answer to this question can be considered a correction. Not really 64 tons. Falcon Heavy, along with Falcon 9 full thrust, is in fact a part of a family. The main advantage of SpaceX rockets is a significant reduction of the operational cost. However, these indicators are achieved through the use of additional elements, which as a result reduce the payload weight. In fact, the reusable Falcon 9 is a medium lift launch vehicle, capable of launching nearly 9.6 tons to the low Earth orbit, but this reusable configuration costs just 40 million dollars. Very cheap for this market. As practice shows, most of the demand falls on this segment. And if you want to launch heavier payloads, you can use expendable versions. But SpaceX announced that they are focusing to make most of their launches reusable. And now, if you want to order a heavy rocket, you can have the Falcon Heavy in a fully reusable configuration, allowing to launch about 30 tons to the low Earth orbit. Now Falcon Heavy becomes just a heavy class vehicle with a cost of about 90 million. Once again, very cheap for this class. Thus, the rockets of the current Falcon family remain the most powerful in their classes with attractive starting prices in the world market. And in case of special orders, both rockets can be made expendable, increasing their launch performance. But in the long term, this will be considered an exception, rather than something normal. Nevertheless, Falcon Heavy will still remain an exotic rocket. SpaceX, now using all the technologies of the already created rockets, is working on a new, even more savage generation of carriers. But this is a completely different story. And this is all for today. We flew into space and can now return to Earth. Like, subscribe and comment below what do you think about this flying marvel. Fast flights and safe launches to you.